You're good to go. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker today, uh, Kamalika Chaudhry. She's a professor at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Technology in Computer Science and Engineering uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. And she completed her PhD uh, in Computer Science at, the, at UC Berkeley in 2007. Uh, she did a postdoc uh, at the Information Theory and Application Center at UC San Diego, and then joined the same university's uh, Computing Science and Engineering uh, Department. Uh, she did a Sapphire Award, a Hellman Faculty Fellowship, um, and her interests are in the foundations of trustworthy uh, machine learning, uh, including problems such as uh, learning from sensitive data while preserving privacy, learning under sampling bias and in the presence of adversary. Um, she's particularly interested in privacy preserving machine learning, which addresses how to learn good models and predictors from sensitive data while preserving the privacy of individuals. Um, and it sounds like she's going to talk about uh, two specific types of um, definitions, I guess, of privacy today. Um, so we're all very looking forward to it. Go ahead, Kamalika. Thank you, Nidhi. So um, what I would be talking about today are um, uh, a couple of new, uh, you know, a couple of case studies in um, kind of private data analysis where, you know, we are trying to do statistics based on sensitive data and we are trying to kind of define um, the right notion of privacy for it. And this is um, a reasonably, you know, a bit of a theoretical talk. Uh, this is a little bit on the theoretical side because we'll be dealing with a lot of, um, you know, definitions and their properties and so on. But what I will do is I will start out by motivating um, uh, how complicated privacy is, okay? So, you know, as you guys all know, a lot of data that, um, you know, machine learning algorithms use right now, a lot of it is uh, sensitive data, right? So things like, you know, medical records or genetic data or search logs. So I'll start out by talking about some of the things that uh, can go wrong if we don't pay attention to privacy, okay? And uh, so here is an example from, this is from back in 2006 when, um, you know, I, I am old enough that that's when I started working on privacy. So this is from back in, I guess, 2005 or 2006, where what happened was that, you know, AOL back in the day, it was, um, you know, it was a search company, they had a search engine. And what they decided to do was that they decided to release some data so that the academics could, you know, help them design better search algorithms. So what they did was, you know, they had a bunch of users and, you know, what these users had searched for and, you know, they released this data. And here is what happened. So this is an article that came out in the New York Times the next day. And what had happened was that it had take the New York Times, taken the New York Times reporter uh, just a few hours to locate a few of the people who were in the data, right? The data, by the way, just to be uh, sure, the data didn't have any names on addresses. It didn't have any usernames. Uh, it had replaced the usernames with numbers like this, 44177749, right? It had replaced them with these random IDs. And uh, it, uh, but still, it took the New York Times reporters just a few hours to come up with some of these. And this is, you know, so this is a picture of a lady who had been, um, who, who had agreed to be interviewed for this article, right? Uh, so this is, you know, so this is one of the things that happened because privacy wasn't taken so seriously. So what happened? So in the end, what happened was that AOL retracted that data set, but you can never take anything off the internet. So if you really look hard enough, I'm sure you can find it, but uh, you know, there, there, there it is. Okay, uh, here is another example. So um, I'm sure uh, most of you may have heard about the Netflix prize, where what happened was that Netflix um, had this competition on recommendation systems. So what they had was that, uh, so, uh, so what they did was they had, again, a bunch of users, right? Where the usernames were replaced by random IDs, uh, random numerical IDs. And then for each user, they had, you know, a list of movies that this user had seen, how they, they had rated these movies. Um, and then they had a bunch of metadata like dates and so on and so forth. 
So Narayan and, and Shmatikov are two security researchers who looked at this um, data. And what they found was the following. What they found was that if you knew two to eight movie ratings for Alice and uh, two to eight movie ratings and approximate dates for Alice, then you could figure out whether Alice was in the data set or not. And if they were in the data set, you could figure out their other movie ratings. So let's say Alice has a blog where she blogs about some of the movies that she's seen and you know how she has liked them. So if you follow Alice's blog, you know a few of the movies that she's watched and how she's liked them. And if she is in the Netflix data set, then you could figure out who she is, right? Uh, you know, you could figure out who she is and then you could figure out what her other movie ratings were, uh, where she may not have uh, chosen to tell you about her other movie ratings and you know what else she has watched and so on and so forth, right? So what happened over here, right? So why do these things keep happening? Well, it keeps happening because um, high dimensional data about people tends to be very, very unique, right? So here is a very toy example that uh, I am giving to you. Suppose my department decides to release a salary table for its employees, right? An anonymized salary table for its employees. And you see a row like this, right? So you have a faculty, female, the department is computer science and engineering and uh, the ethnicity is Southeast Asian. Well, there is uh, exactly one Indian woman faculty in my department. And, um, and the minute you, so the minute you see this row, you know who this refers to. And, uh, you know, the linkage information and what is worse is that the linkage information that links this row to me is proudly displayed on my department website, right? So if you go to my department website, they have a list of, you know, faculty pictures and their interests and their profiles and so on. And the minute you go to that website, you immediately know who, um, who this refers to, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, you can't exactly blame my department for having a good website. So that's, you know, so you can't really blame them for displaying the linkage information. Uh, but, you know, this, uh, this poses a problem, right? And, um, in some sense, this kind of explains why privacy um, is increasingly becoming a harder and harder problem. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, back in, you know, if this happened back in the 90s, you would probably, or, you know, in the 80s, right, you would probably have to go to my department, you, you know, there should be some faculty directory, you would have to look through the faculty directory and find out who I was. But now you can do this with a single click. Right. So what has happened is that the linkage linkage information has become much more easily available and searchable and so on and so forth. And that is why privacy has become a much harder problem. OK. So, um, OK, so what we conclude from this is that if you simply anonymize and release data, then uh, that can be unsafe. Uh, what about releasing statistics based on data? Okay, and this was, uh, you know, this this is actually one of a bunch of studies that was done, uh, and this is a kind of an early one which was done by Wang et al. on um, uh, basically disease association studies. So I, um, you know, know almost nothing about biology, so I can give you my cartoon view of, uh, you know, cartoon uh, picture of what these studies are. Um, uh, hopefully, there are not too many biologists in the audience. So the way to think about this these are you have two groups of patients right and you know one one group has cancer and one group is healthy and in each of these groups of uh, patients uh, you have certain regions in your dna uh, which are which differ from people to people these are called snips and these regions are um, uh, set you know you are hoping that these regions are set differently in cancer patients versus uh, versus the healthy patients right and so what you are doing over here is you are looking at these two you know, pairs of these regions. So think of these as bits, bit string zero one. So you're looking at pairs of bits uh, and you are looking at, uh, let's just say correlations between pairs of bits, right? Um, for both cancer, for these two groups of patients, these cancer patients and the patients who are healthy, right? And uh, what these researchers found was that if you look at these correlations, if you release these correlations, and if you have some knowledge about uh, Alice's DNA, then you can figure out whether Alice is in the cancer set or she's in the healthy set. 
right? And um, which you may not have, you know, which you may not have known before, right? So what happened over here? Well, what happened was the following. What happened was that these tables had, uh, there were a lot of SNPs, right? So these tables were really large. And we are talking about a few thousands of SNPs, which is very common in these kinds of genome wide association studies. However, these tables were computed based on a few hundred people's data. Right. So uh, so now you can see what's happening. You have a lot of equations, not enough unknowns. And the result is that you can figure out what are the SNPs that, you know, what are the SNP uh, profiles that went into computing these tables. And if you knew a little bit about Alice's SNP profile, if you knew a few SNPs, you will find that the rest are quite unique. And uh, as a result, you could figure out whether Alice is in the cancer set or she's in the healthy set. Okay, so what did we see over here? What we saw is that simply anonymizing data is unsafe, right, which we have seen. Um, but statistics on small data sets, especially if you're releasing a lot of statistics based on data sets that are not very big, that can also be quite unsafe. And overall, what we'll see, you know, throughout this talk and overall in the entire privacy literature, what we find is that there is always this, uh, this kind of a three-way trade-off between privacy, uh, how much privacy you can give, uh, how much accuracy you can get. So how accurately can you do a certain analysis? And the third aspect of this is data size, right? So here, this is, you know, the number of subjects. So if, since you are giving individual level privacy, here, uh, the relevant uh, data size is the number of subjects or the number of people in your data, right? And, um, and to kind of understand this trade-off better and to kind of um, figure out what privacy means in certain situations, what we are going to do is we uh, we need a rigorous notion of privacy. Um, generally, you know, ad hoc anonymization or just you know releasing the statistics on data sets, um, you know. Um, doesn't uh, necessarily give you privacy. Uh, what we need to do is we need um, to look at this uh, problem a bit rigorously. Okay. And so this brings uh, us to what I work on. Um, so there's been, of course, a lot of rigor, uh, you know, work on rigorously defining privacy for kind of the last 10, uh, 10 to 15 years or so. So what I work on in this space is um, on privacy modeling and definitions. Uh, what this means is I um, try to formalize what privacy means for certain kinds of problems and then uh, design mechanisms that satisfy these uh, formalisms, right? So this is uh, kind of um, what my group does. And the state of the art in this area is that there are a few concrete applications where privacy has been implemented or is in the process of being implemented. An example of this is the US census in 2020, they implemented differential privacy. Um, in Apple, there are, um, you know, Apple has an implementation of reporting user statistics um, with differential privacy. Uh, Google is doing um, certain forms of private federated learning. Uh, so there are a few concrete applications, but um, uh, however, there are many, many emerging privacy challenges. So things like, you know, location privacy, um, privacy in text, um, yeah, then privacy in especially with, um, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, wearable devices. Um, so there are many, many emerging privacy challenges. And unfortunately, sorry, many of the solutions for these challenges so far has been fairly ad hoc. Okay, so um, and so on. On the one hand, this is um, this is not great because we have a lot of work to do. But on the other hand, um, what this means is that uh, there's there's a lot of problems that can keep us really busy. Okay, um, and uh, and uh, and that's kind of um, you know so that's that's kind of the space uh, that I I work on. Okay, and today what we'll do is we will talk about, um, you know, so in this entire literature, there are generally two styles of rigorous privacy de definitions. So one is differential privacy, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about, and the other is inferential privacy, okay? 
So um, what is inferential privacy? So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, first. So inferential privacy works in the following way. And, you know, inferential privacy has been, uh, I must say that it has been used for a very long time, but it wasn't really um, formalized, uh, you know, so um, it has been used for a very long time, but it wasn't really, you know, kind of formalized into a formal framework. Uh, until reasonably recently. So this is this um, paper um, by Kifar and Machanavajala, which gave, um, you know, which proposed a kind of formal way of writing things down for inferential privacy. Uh, and the way inferential privacy works is, uh, let's say you assume that your adversary has certain kinds of prior knowledge, then they look at a private release and uh, based on this private release, they update their prior knowledge into a posterior knowledge, right? And inferential privacy, is, you know, ensures that if you have a certain forms of um, prior knowledge, then your posterior will be close to the prior, right? So you will not learn of certain things if you have certain kinds of prior knowledge. And this is, you know, of course, this is only possible for certain adversity classes. It's not possible for everything. Um, and, uh, and that is uh, inferential privacy. Okay, oh, something I'm, oh, oh, wait, my slides are not, sorry guys, my slides are, okay, there you go. Okay, in contrast, differential privacy works a little bit differently. So what differential privacy ensures is that the participation of a single person in the data does not change the output by very, does not change the outcome by very much, right? So what does this mean? Well, what this means is, suppose you have an algorithm, right? So maybe you have a clustering algorithm or a classification, you know, something you're uh, building a classifier or computing a statistic. Suppose I took out Alice from my data and I replaced her with Bob right? And this algorithm has to be a randomized algorithm. So if it's a randomized algorithm, then its output is drawn from some distribution. Um, this algorithm is differentially private. If the distribution of its outputs, when Alice uh, was one of the inputs, and if I, uh, you know, in these two cases, so case one is when I have Alice in my data, case two is I have everything else is the same, but I take out Alice and I replace her with Bob, so in these two cases, the distributions of the outputs are uh, very similar. Okay, and again, um, as you know, we have uh, kind of mentioned earlier, uh, these both these definitions have certain trade offs. So you can't do everything with privacy, and the trade off is again between you know privacy, accuracy, and data size, right? So these are you know this is um, kind of the three way trade off that you. Um, uh, that you have, and um, uh, what determines this trade-off in some sense is the complexity of the task that you're trying to do, right? So for example, if you just want to calculate uh, a simple statistic like sample median, this trade-off is going to be much, much better than if you wanted to um, you know, train a large neural network. Uh, network based on the sensitive data, right? So, uh, so the complexity of the task that you're trying to do is uh, very much a part of this uh, trade-off. Okay. Okay. Um, so next, what we will do is, so this is maybe a good time for some questions if there are any. Uh, and if not, then the next what we will do is we will talk about uh, two, you know, new things that we have been doing in this space. So uh, one is in the space of differential privacy. We have uh, kind of um, moved into uh, so, so we have proposed a new uh, definition called capacity bounded privacy, and the second is in the space of inferential privacy. We, we are looking at something called profile based privacy. Okay, any uh, questions so far? I don't see any questions in the chat box, so um, we can assume that there aren't any right now. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so let's let's go ahead then. Uh, so remember, this was um, our definition of differential privacy. What happened was that you had uh, data and which fed into a randomized algorithm. And if you took out one of the people in the data and replaced them with somebody else, so for example, if you took out Alice and replaced her with Bob, then the output distributions would be quite similar. 
right? Uh, so what does this mean for the point of view of an attacker? Well, an attacker who is watching what is happening to the output of this algorithm, um, basically to this attacker, the output um, of this algorithm on some data plus Alice looks more or less the same as the output of this algorithm uh, on the same data plus Bob. Right. And uh, so how do we formalize this? This is formalized in the following way. Uh, for all data sets D and D prime that differ in a single person's value, if A is an epsilon differentially private randomized algorithm, then uh, the following uh, equation holds. What this means is that the likelihood that A of D um, uh, takes a certain value um, over the likelihood that A of D prime takes that value, right? So the ratio uh, log of the ratios of these likelihoods is bounded, right? Uh, and if you look at this, uh, squint at this a little bit closely, this is essentially the max divergence, right? In information theory, this is what is called the max divergence between A of D, you know, A of D is a distribution, remember, and A of D prime, okay? Uh, so, um, so this is kind of the basic definition. A question now is what happens when the adversary is bounded, right? So, you know, in real life, uh, here the adversary basically has infinite computational power and, you know, uh, and they can also have infinite amounts of prior knowledge, right? Uh, the definition will still hold. In real life, however, the adversaries may be bounded in um, various different ways. So, for example, they may be bounded in certain kinds of, uh, with, with respect to their computational power, right? An example of this might be automated adversaries, right? So um, which are just kind of proce processing, these are like programs which may be processing a large amount of data. Another application of this might be in designing data usage contracts, right? Because these days, um, a lot of the uh, a lot of places, if you get sensitive data, there is a data usage contract that comes with it, which tells you that there are certain things you can't do, right? So you know, I um, in my group we got this, um, you know, we got some educational data, and it came with a contract that you can't um, merge it with other data sets. Right, so these kinds of, uh, uh, so if we had a notion, if we had some formal notion of what might be doable for bounded adversaries, then we can also use them to design better data usage contracts, right? So we can use them in formal designing of data usage contracts, right? So, uh, so that is what we are going to do uh, in capacity bounded privacy. We are going to try to model privacy against bounded adversaries, okay? So how, um, how, how do we model privacy? So before we get into this, let us look at a quick relaxation of differential privacy into uh, what is called KL differential privacy, right? So here, what we are going to do is remember how in differential privacy, we were measuring the distance between these two distributions, A of D and A of D prime, in terms of the max divergence. Instead of max divergence, now what we'll do is we will look at KL divergence. Okay, so why, why do we do that? The reason why we do this is because the KL divergence has a very nice variational form, right? So we can look at the variational uh, form of the KL divergence between two distributions P and Q can be written in the following form. This is the supremum over um, H, which belongs to the class of, uh, you know, in the class of all functions, expectation of H of X with respect to P minus expectation of e to the h of x minus one with respect to q, right? And, uh, and this uh, gives you a measure of um, how any function can um, tell p and q apart, okay? And uh, once we can look at it, you know, once we look at this uh, divergence in this particular form, uh, this automatically suggests a way of limiting the class of adversaries, right? So you can think about functions that are trying to tell P and Q apart as adversaries, right? And now what we can do is we can try to restrict this function class, okay? And uh, that is exactly what we will do. Uh, instead of KL divergence, we can define the H-restricted KL divergence 
divergence, where a function for a function class H, we define this H restricted gale divergence as um, instead of allowing all functions, you know, functions in all, um, you know, all functions. Now we kind of uh, bound our function class to allow a certain uh, certain class of functions, right? And what this does is it measures um, how any function in this function class H can tell P and Q apart. And uh, this kind of this form can be defined for any F divergence, right? So it's not uh, something that is um, uh, really uh, special to Kale divergence. This can be defined for any F divergence. And um, so this is, you know, just a somewhat technical slide uh, for F divergences. If you remember, F divergences can be written in this specific way. You have two distributions, P and Q. Um, that F divergence is the expectation of X being drawn from Q, uh, a function F where F is a convex function applied to DP over DQ. Right? Right? And examples include things like Kale divergence, Denson Shannon, alpha divergences, and so on. Uh, any F divergence has a very nice variational form uh, where you have. Um, where um, you can use functions in uh, you know uh, to tell um, p and q apart you know it can be written in this form and in these cases we can again restrict um, f to the function class h to get the restricted divergence okay and some of you guys uh, and this might be familiar to some of you guys who um, who may be familiar with gans uh, in some sense this is what you know there's a variation of gans called f gans this is exactly what f gans do right so f gans uh, for FCANs, what happens is P is the original data distribution, key is, uh, Q is the distribution of generated examples, and you are trying to uh, let D, F, the F diver, you know, some kind of F divergence between P and Q, you are trying to let that go to zero, right? You are trying to come up with a generator that lets uh, that divergence uh, go to zero. Okay, so uh, so there, uh, there there is kind of the connection. Um, in our case, however, we won't uh, you know we we won't try to come up with generators. But we'll do what we'll do is we will try to design mechanisms such that this restricted divergences, right? So, for example, for H restricted Kale differential privacy, we'll try to ensure that the H restricted Kale divergence is um, at most epsilon uh, when you change one person's data. Okay. Uh, okay, so that was uh, for Kale divergence, um, but differential privacy was, you know, initially uh, defined with respect to the max divergence, and then it has been relaxed to um, Rennie divergences with, uh, you know, Rennie divergence with, um, uh, with, with, uh, you know, of a certain order. Uh, so what about Rennie? Uh, you know, so this is the definition of Rennie differential privacy your um, algorithm, uh, your mechanism is said to be um, epsilon alpha Rennie differentially private if the Rennie divergence of order alpha between A of D and A of D prime is always at most epsilon. And uh, it turns out that Rennie is not an F divergence, but it is uh, related to something called an alpha divergence in closed form. And these alpha divergences are F divergences. So we can also use them to define restricted Rennie divergences, right? So, so basically for Rennie divergences, uh, things work out. It's a little bit more complicated because for the definition, you have to go through something else, but uh, you know you, you can get a definition of this form, okay? Okay, so this is how we are modeling privacy against bounded adversaries. Now, what kind of properties would these uh, capacity bounded privacy have? Okay, and this is kind of important because uh, differential privacy, as it turns out, uh, one of the reasons why differential privacy is used quite a bit is because it has a lot of, uh, you know, it has a lot of good properties, which uh, people find uh, very helpful in many applications. So some of these properties are things like convexity, con composition, and post-processing invariance. Convexity means that if you have two mechanisms uh, and you pick one with probability P and pick another one with probability one minus P, well, the resulting thing stays private. 
And as it happens, um, a lot of these translate, right? A lot of these go through for um, these capacity bounded privacy as well. And in fact, for, um, you know, uh, for any kind of age bounded kale privacy will satisfy convexity. And, um, and it, not just uh, kale privacy, this kind of thing will hold for any F divergence based privacy, okay? Another, uh, you know, uh, good property is post-processing invariance. So differential privacy has this. What it means is that if you have a private uh, result, right, if you have the output of an epsilon private algorithm and you post-process it uh, through any other means without going back to the sensitive data, then your result will stay epsilon private. Okay, uh, you can't expect arbitrary post-processing for uh, privacy against bounded adversaries. I mean, if you do, um, you know, then you can't hope to do anything better than unbounded adversaries. Uh, but we can show certain kinds of limited post-processing. So if you are doing post-processing with respect to functions that are closed with respect to your age, then you will have, um, post-processing. So you have uh, limited amounts of post-processing. Um, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, sorry, sometimes this. Uh... And finally, another excellent property of differential privacy, which makes it very amenable and robust is something called graceful composition. So what this means is that as you use the same private data set, right, the same sensitive data set in multiple releases, your privacy guarantees don't degrade a lot. Um, if you release as like, as a general rule, if you do multiple releases, from any private data set, right? And any privacy mechanism, you will have some kind of, you know, as, as you keep doing more releases, you will have more privacy losses, right? So to give you kind of a, uh, you know, to kind of a an anecdotal example of this, um, you know, I used to read this, um, uh, you know, back in the early two, uh, 2010s, you know, blogs were a big thing. So I used to read this anonymous academics blog, right? And this lady would blog about, you know, she would blog about her life and you know and stuff like that and she was uh, she was anonymous right so uh, but then she would start revealing you know little things like you know she was in um, in the US in the Midwest somewhere and then she reveals you know something about her geographical region and then suddenly one day I realized I knew who she was right and you know so this is an example of um, non-graceful composition right and what differential privacy tells you is that this you know this leakage would happen but this leakage would happen somewhat gracefully and you know as you can imagine this is a you know a very good property to have and um, uh, but anyway so coming back to the uh, so coming back to um, this talk uh, capacity bounded privacy also satisfies this kind of thing right also satisfies satisfies this level of graceful composition. If you have an algorithm based on the same, <coughs> excuse me, same private data, where the algorithm one is H1 epsilon capacity bounded private, and algorithm two is H2 epsilon capacity bounded private, then the combination is H1 plus H2 two epsilon capacity bounded private under certain, you know, fairly mild regularity conditions on H1 and H2. And, um, and this is, uh, you know, kind of a good property. What this tells you is that um, your uh, privacy guarantees don't suddenly just go, uh, they don't suddenly fly off the window. Uh, they kind of degrade gracefully as you release more and more stuff. Um, so that was uh, kind of uh, the properties. Now let's look at uh, a couple of mechanisms. Uh, a special case is uh, linear KL privacy, where we are looking at linear functions and uh, KL uh, capacity bounded privacy. As a sanity check, if we do a non-private release, uh, the lin KL still gives us infinity, right? And this makes sense because if you are just, uh, you know, uh, releasing um, just a non-private value without adding any random noise, then uh, with Alice's data and with Bob's data, you are going to, you know, you're going to get slightly different results if Alice and Bob's private values are different. And uh, so uh, these distributions are, you know, they're just like delta, delta functions, right? And the Linkel blows up. 
as well. So this is a good sanity check. Um, but uh, you can also, what you can also do is you can also look at um, the standard differential privacy mechanisms and you can calculate what they are, uh, what kind of privacy they would offer under, you know, capacity bounded, uh, under the capacity bounded definition. And what you find is that they offer, um, you know, their privacy parameters tend to be a little bit better, right? So here is an example where we can do the calculation in closed form, but uh, there's, there's a bunch of uh, examples where we can, uh, we can, uh, we can do these examples. Um, there is something called the Gaussian mechanism in differential privacy. There, unfortunately, things don't improve under linear KL because um, uh, for linear KL, the best function that separates, uh, you know, that, that function that, uh, that achieves the supremum, that is a linear function. So linear KL doesn't really help. Um, uh, however, these are again a list of other, you know, so in our paper, we did a whole bunch of uh, calculations and we found that it did help a little bit in a lot of different cases. So for alpha Reni, we can do, you know, we can do the analysis for Gaussian and Laplace and, uh, you know, various other standard mechanisms um, in low dimensions as well as high dimensions. And we found that it did help and in high dimensions, it helped um, a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so, um, related work, uh, prior to us, people had also looked at capacity bounded privacy, uh, but not in this particular form. So this is a new formulation. People had looked at what happened if your adversary was, uh, couldn't solve NP hard problems. And there were, there was some work on this. Um, however, the definition was, uh, extremely, extremely complicated. Um, and, uh, then there has also been some recent work on um, things related to generative adversarial privacy, uh, where the privacy mechanism is a minimax game between an adversary and a learner. Our um, definition is related, but not exactly the same, right? We are going straight to the uh, bounded divergence instead of going through um, a game between the adversary and the learner, okay? So in conclusion, uh, we looked at um, a new notion of privacy against bounded adversaries. We showed that the definition retains a lot of the good properties of differential privacy, which is kind of important. And we could give, uh, we could propose some mechanisms. Okay. Okay. So questions uh, at this point or... Um, I have, I have a quick question. Um, so you talked about this linear KL privacy. Mm -hmm. um, intuitively, how would I compare that to the epsilon differential privacy, the, the, the basic standard one? Is it, is what's changing the bounds on the privacy, the, the privacy lost? Is it the trade-off between privacy and accuracy that's changing in some way? How, how, how would I compare the two? Ah, so for a particular mechanism, um, what you could do, so, so what we were doing over here is for a particular mechanism, we were uh, calculating how much, uh, what would be its differential privacy parameter versus what would be the, you know, so basically what would be the epsilon for differential privacy versus what would be the epsilon for let's just say linear KL. And we were actually not differential privacy, KL differential privacy, which is a more fair comparison right with uh, linear KL differential privacy uh, so what would so in the terms of the definition the definition is loser right like of course it's more relaxed it doesn't give you worst case privacy against every adversary it only gives you privacy against adversaries which are you know certain classes of functions um, in terms of um, mechanisms what you would expect is the same mechanism would have a better parameter Right, and so conversely, if you wanted to uh, get the same parameter of privacy, you would have better accuracy. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, moving to, uh, so the next, uh, what we will do is we'll, we'll then go ahead and look at um, the second thing I quickly wanted to talk about, which is uh, inferential privacy, okay?
So, uh, so, so far we have been talking about central privacy, where what happens is that, you know, and this is kind of the standard differential privacy definition, where what happens is you have a private curator who gets the raw data of a bunch of users, uh, passes, uh, and then it um, passes out a sanitized output. Right. An example would be, you know, the ex uh, actually the canonical example for this is the census, because, you know, you're not allowed to lie to census. Right. You're not giving your private, you know, you're not privatizing your information and giving it to the census. You are giving the census your raw information. And then what they are doing is they are, you know, adding noise or, you know, before prior to differential privacy, they were doing some other things. Um, so they, they are doing, you know, various things and then they're releasing the sanitized output. OK, so this is the central privacy. Um, and here your curator is trusted. A popular definition, which is actually used quite a lot in the industry, is what is known as local privacy. So here what happens is, you know, um, user, you know, you have the users, right? Users have their raw data. They sanitize their raw data themselves, and then they pass it over to the aggregator. So an example of this would be, you know, the kind of thing that uh, Google does, right? So Google has this uh, kind of huge federated learning system, which is learning an image classifier. And what it does is it takes the images from your phone. It adds a lot of noise to them to give you privacy. And then it ships over the noisy, um, noisy image, right? And this kind of thing actually works really well for companies because, you know, it's, it's not clear that you trust Google. Uh, I certainly don't, but you know, I mean, um, you, you may be different. It's, it's not clear that uh, how much people trust Google with their sensitive data. And uh, also, uh, Google doesn't always want to you know, gather your sensitive data because they may be subpoenaed and, you know, they don't, they don't want to deal with that stuff, right? Like they, they may not even want to gather your sensitive data anyway, right? So, um, yeah, so, so, so for, uh, for industry applications, this local privacy is kind of the emerging privacy model, okay? The unfortunate thing with local privacy, however, is that it tends to be, you know, achieving it and utility tends to be really, really hard, right? Why is this hard? The reason why this is hard is uh, let's look at the form of the uh, guarantee that you get for local privacy, right? So the form of the guarantees that you would get for local differential privacy would be uh, you apply your algorithm, right? Your privacy mechanism uh, before you send it over to the aggregator. So you apply your algorithm to user one, right? Uh, and uh, and then you are sending out, you know, the output of the algorithm to this aggregator. But uh, here is the kind of guarantee that you should get. The probability that your algorithm um, outputs T is more or less the same as the probability that your algorithm outputs S for any S and T in the domain, right? So what this means is that you, um, you know, it's, it's very, very noisy, right? It's almost close to uniform. It's very, very noisy. Uh, and as a result, what happens is your utility, if you're guaranteeing this kind of privacy, then your utility has to be really quite low. Okay. So uh, how, uh, how do we, you know, how can we address this? Um, well, uh, we address this through something known as uh, through, through more fine grained local privacy. Okay, so what do I mean by more fine grained? Well, for some applications, you may not need to blur all S and T in the domain, right? An example could be would be you know uh, is something called location privacy, uh, where what is happening is you know your location um, is being kind of beamed up to Google through your mobile phone. Now you know. Um, uh, you may be kind of, I mean, Google knows who you are, right? If you have an Android phone, they know who you are. So it's, uh, you may be comfortable knowing that, uh, for example, I am comfortable that Google knows that I am in San Diego. There's, there's no way they can avoid knowing it. Uh, however, I may not be super comfortable in them knowing my exact location. Right, so I don't need to blur out every S and T. Maybe I am fine with, let's just say, neighborhood level privacy. Right, so you know, uh, maybe uh, it's it's okay that uh, you know, or or maybe even block level privacy. Right, so they need to enough 
added of noise so that they blur out uh, you know my location to a particular within a particular block or within a particular neighborhood but i don't need to be you know it's it's okay that they know i'm in uh, san diego right so that's an example of fine grained privacy uh, so this is you know this is this was actually done before so this is something known as geo indistinguishability uh, what we are looking to do is we are looking to uh, generalize this this notion right so generalize this notion of fine grained local privacy okay so the way that we would do it is through something called profiles right so what is a profile a uh, profile uh, you know the set of profiles is um, or rather a profile is a possible set of uh, you know is a set of events that are to be kept secret and what we will do is we will model them through distributions bi right so for uh, an example would be um, let's say uh, so this was you know the first time i gave this talk it was uh, in the bay area so um, so this is this could be uh, a profile could be let's say i um, live in berkeley street a and i commute to san francisco right so it could be the distribution of trajectories uh, the distribution of the routes i take from berkeley street a to san francisco and you know maybe every day i take a slightly different route um, you know or over time i i've taken you know maybe there are seven or six or seven routes that i take okay so this could be the distribution over them so this is a profile and um what we can do is um between profiles we can have edges right which represent pairs of profiles um that we need to be indistinguishable right so uh, and putting these together we will have what is called the profile graph right so a profile graph is a graph where the nodes are profiles and the edges are pairs of profiles that we need to keep indistinguishable uh, an example would be let's say i live in street a and commute to san francisco um, my friend lives in street b and commutes to san francisco and we might want these two trajectories to be you know these two these routes to be indistinguishable right whereas if somebody lives in let's just say um, menlo park and commutes to san francisco Uh, it's okay that you can you know that the adversary can tell that we are different uh, so you don't need to um you know it, it's okay to be able to differentiate between you know routes that go from menlo park uh, which is you know down south to san francisco but maybe not routes that go from berkeley to san francisco or berkeley street a to san francisco versus berkeley street b to san francisco the adversary maybe should not be able to distinguish between them okay uh, so this naturally leads to this privacy definition for all edges pi and pj in um, in the profile graph um, your algorithm which takes in um, an input point and profile description uh, the probability that this algorithm outputs y conditioned on x comes from pi should be more or less the same uh, as this uh, the probability that this algorithm outputs y conditioned on x coming from pj right and these should be within a ratio of e to the epsilon where epsilon is again the privacy parameter right so this kind of corresponds to epsilon uh, db okay uh, and this is also um, somewhat uh, you know related to a bunch of other definitions uh, it generalizes uh, geo indistinguishability as i uh, you know as i mentioned earlier it's also related to something called um, puffer fish privacy so this is a local form of puffer fish privacy which is you know a nice definition formal definition for inferential privacy um, there is also something called blow fish um, so it's a, a slide generalization of that uh, but blow fish is again in the central um, you know in the central model um, it's also related to something called max leakage constraint hypothesis testing if you have heard about it but it's it's a little bit different in the sense that the goals are a little bit different here okay okay so now we have talked about modeling uh, fine grained privacy uh, what are some of these properties again um, as it happens that uh, we do retain some of the good properties of differential privacy so first of all we can get post processing invariance for any algorithm 
right? Which we, uh, you know, which we have in differential privacy. For graceful composition, uh, usually there are two kinds of graceful composition, right? So one is when you, um, one is called sequential composition. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, if you use the same data in multiple releases, then your privacy guarantee decays slowly. Uh, parallel composition is if you use um, different data sets, uh, then you get the same amount of privacy, right? Different unrelated data sets in multiple releases, then, you know, it's the same amount of privacy. For local inferential privacy, things are actually a bit more complicated, right? And uh, what happens is that, I mean, I won't go into a lot of details, but what happens is that uh, you can come up with actually four distinct settings, depending on how the profiles are chosen and how they're released. Uh, there is an analog of additive sequential composition that goes through. There is an, also an analog of a parallel composition where you're choosing the profiles um, randomly. That also goes through. But there are some cases where uh, you cannot get great uh, graceful composition when, you know, mostly when the profile selections could be highly dependent, right? So there are some cases where you can't get the composition result, but there are some, uh, you know, some of the basic um, things go through, okay? So uh, what about mechanisms? Well, uh, let's look at a very simple discrete setting, right? So your observation is a single bit. Uh, your profiles are PI and PJ, right? In profile uh, in PI, uh, the probability that this bit is one is PI. In pro profile PJ, the probability that this bit is one is PJ, right? And so you, know, you have a simple profile graph, a single edge, right? Now, your, the most natural mechanism that comes to mind is you flip your bit with probability P. The question is, how do you pick this flipping probability, right? And if you have really low P, then you, you know, that is good because you have high utility, but you may not get sufficient privacy. And if your P is too high, then, you know, again, you have this other problem, right? You, you may not have sufficient, um, uh, you know, you will have utility, uh, you, you will have privacy, but you may not have sufficient utility. Right. And sorry. And as, as it happens in this case, we can find the flip probability P by solving an optimization problem. Uh, and the problem will, you know, roughly look like this. So it's a linear program. We can write down the privacy constraints in terms of linear constraints on P. And then, you know, we can solve, solve this. Okay. So it's a, it's a simple linear program. Um, and then this gives rise to the one bit mechanism when you find the flip probability P by solving this optimization problem and then you just flip it. Okay. And uh, again, I won't go into a lot of mathematical details, but, you know, just with a little bit more mess, you can do this for any kind of profile, um, uh, you know, any, any kind of categorical profiles, right? So if your profiles are categorical distributions, you can do this, uh, do a similar thing. And also for any kind of profile graphs. So for more complicated profile graphs, things get more complicated, you have more constraints, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, but essentially you can you know essentially you can do this kind of thing right you can do this uh, do this kind of uh, thing uh, and uh, what about utility so for this one bit mechanism uh, if your uh, what you can show is that your flip probability is going to be pj minus pi which were the flip probability uh, you know which were the head probabilities uh, for the two um, distributions for, for the two profiles uh, over 1 plus e to the epsilon if you had a corresponding local DP mechanism with privacy parameter epsilon, then your flip probability would be one over one plus e to the epsilon, right? So here you're always getting an improvement and the amount of improvement that you will get will depend on how close your profiles are. And in the worst case, it will be as bad as local DP. And, uh, you know, finally, you know, here are some simulations. Um, again, you have this very simple profile graph and the one bit mechanism. Um, here, your profile two is, uh, you know, the x-axis is the P for profile two, and uh, we have, uh, you know, how much uh, your flipping probability, uh, we are plotting the flip flipping probability for three different um, uh, profile one. So one is profile one is zero, one is profile one is um, 
0.25 and you know the blue line is when profile one is 0.5 and what you see is uh, it, it's always better than the local dp uh, baseline and in a bunch of cases you know especially when the profiles themselves are really noisy it's able to get privacy for free um, and uh, it, it doesn't need to uh, you know flip with extra, uh, it, it, you don't need to flip with extra, you know, probability again, right? That the bit that you get, you don't need to modify it. Okay. So finally, in conclusion, uh, what we did was we presented a form of differential privacy against capacity bounded adversaries, uh, a form of inferential privacy in the local setting. And in both cases, we got mechanisms which had um, better privacy and utility trade offs. Um, uh, and um, I will uh, finally end with, you know, so these are the two references and I will finally end with, um, you know, uh, pictures of the people who made it happen. So Jacob uh, was the first, uh, was uh, the first author in the New Rips paper, which is the um, capacity bounded privacy. Joseph was the, um, is my co-author for the um, profile based privacy paper and Ashwin is our collaborator. Right. So with this, um, I will uh, stop. Great. Thank you, Kamalika. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, since we're at one o'clock, there looks like some people might have already been on their way to their next meeting. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, um, I'll ask a question. Um, so the example you used when you introduced your profile based privacy is that of location privacy. Right. Um, so are you are you thinking of a profile as a trajectory? Is that is that the granularity at which you're looking at or um, uh, and the reason I'm asking that is because you may have certain paths, like every day you go from home to work, but sometimes you go uh, off to get breakfast before you go to work. Um, and are these going to be considered two profiles? Like, is there this notion of overlap between pro profiles or similarity between profiles that, that matters here? Um, so you could model it. Uh, so so that's, that's one, one of the ways of modeling it. Right. So if you were looking to um, release trajectories, you could model it as two distinct profiles and you could say that, look, these two should be indistinguishable. So that would be one way to model it. Um, OK, but the fact but the fact that there are commonalities, does that help? That's, that's OK. That's, you know, that's, that, that's, that's OK. okay. That's fine. That's actually in some sense that uh, does help you get privacy for free in some sense, right? Like if you imagine two profiles are very, very similar, then you may not need to add a lot of noise to blur the inputs of, uh, to blur the, uh, blur, blur the draws from them. Mm -hmm. um, and with this, um, how easily would you apply this to a situation where you're not really looking at, you know, uh, geolocations, but you're looking at, you know, if each of these trajectory points is somehow uh, dependent on the next point, um, you know, going away from that, but just looking at a data set that has points that are dependent on each other. Yeah, that is in fact a very, um, that, that's an excellent question. And that is in fact the key problem in location privacy. So um, yeah, so profiles don't always, always give you a good solution. But we have an upcoming paper where we um, have a slightly different uh, inferential privacy solutions where we model these as Gaussian processes uh, with a certain degree of, so you know, for Gaussian processes, you can build in a certain amount of spatiotemporal correlation and it will blur um, spatiotemporal correlations um, up to a certain amount. If things are completely, completely correlated, if you know my first location, if you know everything about me, then there's not much you can do, as you can imagine, right? Like, you know, uh, but uh, we, we have some other solutions, which are, you know, in the beginning, we thought these would be the solution, but in the end, um, this approach didn't quite get us there. So we have a different solution for that problem. But you are absolutely right. That is, in fact, the key problem in location privacy. It's not about blurring a single location. It's about blurring 
several highly dependent locations, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, I have to say, thank you for your talk. Um, this privacy privacy is a fairly new topic for us in this department, so I think we uh, we all learned quite a lot from your. Uh, sorry, my puppy is getting out of hand here. Um, we're learning. <laughs> we're learning. Um, we've learned quite a lot from your uh, presentation, which was quite pedagogical. Um, so I'm going to ask one more time if there are any questions. Um, it might just be that everything is so new that people haven't had time to sort of absorb it yet. <laughs> um, okay. Can I ask a question on, on voice? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, I like what uh, the first thing that you talked about, uh, the differential privacy with like limited functions, and you sort of motivated it with, uh, with an example of an adversary that is only allowed to perform certain kinds of analyses mm -hmm. or um, and uh, and you sort of uh, that showed up in the theory as restricting the function class on which you are sort of uh, calculating the KL divergence or the variational form. Right. Uh, could you tie that back and like give a like a for a, like example of a real world restriction that might be in a contract uh, versus what kind of function class it leads to? Because for the example you used was that you might not be allowed to combine the information with a certain other data set or something like that, right? So right, right, right. what kind yes, of restricted I, function class would that lead to? So that, um, yeah, so unfortunately that is an informational uh, thing, but something that you could do is you could say that, you know, you can't train a neural network on this, right? Um, and you know it's it's okay. I mean, uh, you can't train a neural network on this, right? So that could be an example of um, of a real world kind of thing. Uh, right now, nobody does that. Right now, all the contracts are all about combining it with other things, um, because you know we we don't know, right? That uh, what computation can give rise to what, right? Um, but an example would be you can't train a neural network on this kind of thing. Yeah. You can only do simple, you know, you can only do these kinds of analysis on this kind like of thing. Like linear regression, like you were yeah. talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and um, yeah, and then maybe another example. So to do this, you kind of had to move from the, like uh, you, you had to go to the expected divergence, a KL divergence setting rather than the max divergence. That's um, correct, yes. And, and so you can also a, get it to work for Reni uh, through a bit of, mess but <laughs> yeah uh, so i was wondering uh, so like you were saying that that is a more relaxed uh, like to introduce this framework to be allowed to restrict the function classes you first had to move to an expectation based framework right rather than the worst case uh, framework which is sort of the normal epsilon differential privacy um, and i was wondering if there is uh, um, like do you have any thoughts on whether it's possible to do this sort of thing in the worst case framework I see. So the problem with max divergence is that max divergence itself doesn't have any kind of, uh, you know, the, doesn't have those variational forms. So it's, uh, it's kind of hard. I don't know. I mean, uh, my answer to this question is, I don't know, it would be very interesting. Uh, you know, it's an open problem for people who know more functional analysis than I do. Um, uh, but however, uh, one answer to your question is that when alpha is really really high, then alpha Reni divergence uh, gets closer and closer to max divergence. And in that case, you can define this kind of thing. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, I don't know exactly for the max if you can, but you know, again, this is a problem for people who know more functional analysis. Yeah, I guess my question was that it is philosophically interesting, but maybe technically hard. Uh, like it would be something that we would like to do, but it's technically hard, right? Like is, it is. is I that... mean, there are still a lot of technical challenges. Like this is very, very new. Um, okay. Of uh, but it, but it, it's yeah. But it's not something that is not interesting. It's just we just don't know how to do it yet. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know. How okay. To do it. I see. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for your question. Um, I think if there are no other questions, we'll uh, end it here. And thank you again, Kamalika, for, for this talk. Uh, thanks for inviting me.